Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to the January 2026 CT Is Us quiz. It's a new year. Many things will change, and they do change every new year. But the one thing that doesn't change is CT Is Us has 10 terrific cases to show you, to discuss with you, and we look forward to a wonderful 2026 for everybody. So with that, let's get started. The most likely cause for a drop in hematocrit in this patient is, well, when you look carefully, what do you see? You see cirrhosis of the liver with fatty infiltration. You then see thickening of the gastric folds, and the fluid in the stomach is high density. When you look on the coronal view, there's an area that's very bright. So what is the cause? Well, that's a bleed in the stomach. So yes, answer A, the patient has cirrhosis and the patient has portal hypertension, but that's not the cause of the bleeding at this point. It's an ulcer in the stomach that's the cause of the bleed. There's no colonic bleed seen here. CT is very good for looking at GI bleeding. We typically think about lower GI bleeding, looking at the small bowel and colon, but also we pick up unsuspected bleeds in the stomach. A key thing, of course, is good gastric distension. Make sure the patient drinks 500 cc's of water before the study is done. And of course, you want to do the study without positive contrast. The most likely diagnosis in this case is, well, you see a large retroperitoneal mass. It's displacing the right kidney. It's slightly displacing the aorta, but what you don't see here is the IVC. Now, this could be lymphoma. Lymphoma presents as masses in the retroperitoneum, but where's the IVC? Lymphoma can displace the IVC, but in this case, it looks like, particularly when you look at the coronal, it's arising from or involving primarily the IVC. Liposarcomas are the most common retroperitoneal mass. They're not always fat density. So in truth, a large retroperitoneal mass could be a liposarcoma. But again, it displaces structures, maybe can invade the IVC, but you don't see the IVC at all here. And of course, germ cell tumors are common retroperitoneal masses uh, in males, typically from testicular tumor. But again, the IVC would be displaced. This lesion arises from the IVC. IVC sarcomas are rare. They're often very vascular. They're often irregular, but they grow from the IVC and they simulate, as in this case, multiple additional lesions. The most likely diagnosis in the 60-year-old with hematuria, well, if I don't look at the images and you tell me it's a 60-year-old, I got to think about renal cell carcinoma. I also would consider bladder cancer. But what do we see here? We see a large necrotic tumor that's somewhat vascular. You see there looks like some extension near the hilum of the kidney. On the coronal view, you can see it very nicely. It's an exophytic mass. It's not the adrenal. It pushes against the spleen. It's vascular. Lymphoma is a thought. Lymphoma can present with large solid masses but usually not so vascular. Transitional cell is more infiltrative, not solid. Papillary renal cells are typically hypovascular. They're not as large as clear cell, and clear cells make up about 80 to 85% of renal cell carcinomas. The classic mass that's very vascular, often with central necrosis, is clear cell renal cell carcinoma, and that's the correct answer. Patients with clear cell when the tumors like this are necrotic, actually do not respond as well to chemotherapy. The most likely diagnosis in this patient, well, when you look carefully at the axial views, there's about a one centimeter vascular lesion in the junction of the body and tail of the pancreas, which is seen even better on the coronal MIP imaging, that one centimeter lesion very nicely seen. Well, adenocarcinoma of the pancreas are hypovascular lesions. 
Metastatic renal cell carcinoma can go to pancreas, and the lesions are typically vascular, so that's a possibility. But I showed you the kidneys, or a little bit of the kidneys, and there's no evidence of nephrectomy. There's no renal mass seen. This is not a vascular malformation. This is a classic neuroendocrine tumor, one centimeter, likely a low-grade neuroendocrine tumor, but a very nice example. It's easy to miss neuroendocrine tumors unless you have arterial phase imaging, and MIP imaging can indeed be very helpful. The most likely diagnosis in this patient, well, there's a mass in the tail of the pancreas, and the mass is hypovascular. I do not see a dilated pancreatic duct, but this is a classic appearance for an adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. Low density lesions, you can think about focal pancreatitis, but there's no stranding around the gland. It doesn't look like autoimmune pancreatitis. It's not a neuroendocrine tumor, which is typically hypervascular. As I mentioned, there's no stranding around the gland, so that tends to rule out pancreatitis, be it autoimmune or classic pancreatitis. This is a classic example of pancreatic adenocarcinoma. The thing about this lesion, I don't see vessel invasion. I don't see on the arterial and venous phase imaging liver metastasis. This patient should do very well with a distal pancreatectomy. In this patient with severe back pain, the best diagnosis? Well, this is an impressive case. On the axial imaging, you can see the patient had a prior endovascular stent, and there's a large aortic aneurysm. But what we see here is active bleeding within the aneurysm, but the large retroperitoneal bleed. The coronal view is particularly good, and that's a coronal 3D volume rendered as showing the active extravasation from the patient's aneurysm. So this is an active bleed from a ruptured aortic aneurysm. It's a surgical emergency. It's not a type 2 endoleak. It's not renal hemorrhage, the left kidney is displaced, and it's not a bleed from anticoagulant therapy. Uh, you can see the bleed is within the aneurysm, and the aneurysm has ruptured, which explains the large retroperitoneal component of the bleed. The most likely diagnosis in this case, interestingly, you see a large mass left lobe of liver with a central scar, when you look at the arterial phase, you can go through a differential diagnosis of several lesions. What's impressive, it's a vascular lesion, but not markedly hypervascular. It's only as bright as the IVC, not as bright as the aorta. On the venous phase imaging, the lesion washes out very quickly. The central scar is seen, and the borders of the liver are seen. This is a classic example of focal nodular hyperplasia. Hepatic adenomas are typically vascular and can wash out, but not as nicely as this case. I once wrote an article saying scars were classic for F and H, but almost any lesion, including hepatic adenoma, can have a central scar. The lesion is not behaving like hepatoma, which are typically vascular but irregular and don't wash out in this pattern. It's not the pattern of hemangioma, which has peripheral puddling and then fills in over time. This is the classic appearance of focal nodular hyperplasia. Usually FNH is an incidental finding, as it was in this case, but usually they're not this large. The most likely diagnosis in this case, what do we see? Well, this is part of a CT angiogram. You can see the left coronary artery and this calcified plaque present. You look at the uh, calcium scoring, which was done on the non-contrast scan, and this calcification is only in the LAD. The Agassiz score was in the 40s. So what can we say? Well, the calcification is eccentric, so this is not a high-grade stenosis. It's atherosclerotic disease. It's not vasculitis and it's not Kawasaki's disease. This is classic coronary artery disease with a plaque in the LAD. Remember, calcium scoring gives you a feel 
of the amount of plaque that is present, but if you want to look at vessel stenosis, you need a coronary artery CTA, as in this case. The most likely diagnosis in this case of a 40-year-old female is, well, what do we see? We see a large anterior metastinal mass, solid, some areas of low density, and in the sagittal view, you can see it comes up into the neck. Yes, from the axials, a teratoma, or thymoma, or lymphoma are all possibilities, but it's high extension, and the fact it's somewhat vascular and has several punctate calcifications make this much more likely to be a substernal extension of the thyroid gland, which it indeed was. Just a very nice example. In this patient post mild trauma, the best diagnosis for the spleen is. So what I'm trying to hint to you is the patient had a CT and the CT was negative, except for the finding which are multiple small lesions in the spleen. If this was immunosuppressed patient, then I would have said fungal infection like candidiasis or aspergillosis. Trauma can give you splenic lacerations or hematomas, but that's not the appearance here. And this is not a normal variant spleen. You can get more ray enhancement patterns, but not these multiple tiny lesions. This is a great example of sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis can involve the spleen, commonly involves liver and spleen, and can have multiple lesions of variable sizes. They can be very small. And this is just a nice example of splenic involvement in sarcoidosis, and it's often picked up incidentally, as it was in this case. Well, those are 10 terrific cases. I think the new year is off to a great start. I hope you got them all right, but more importantly, I hope you learned something. And with that, I wish you a great day and a great year. See you again soon. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS Us YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctsus.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.